Hey guys, what's happening? So we're back for more Predator vs. Black Panther. And man, it's not looking good for Wakanda. So if you're enjoying these videos, be sure to drop a like, subscribe if you're new to the channel, and don't forget to hit that bell up top to get all notifications. Alright, so coming back, we pick up at the Great Mound, where the head Yalcha and his scouts have already started to source Wakanda's vibranium. And as they do, there's a moment here where the head Yalcha, their clan leader, He's holding a piece of vibranium, and as he does, he can just feel its energy pulsing down his arm. And for a moment here, he's just looking at it and visualizing how he's going to upgrade himself and his armor with it, as well as his warships, because after this, the first thing he wants to do is get revenge on his brother and his father. Because not only did his father choose his brother over him, with this predator being the smaller and weaker of the two, but also it's because his father gave his brother the advantage by giving him his vibranium spear which his brother used against him and his clan. And like we saw, this predator's original plan was just to come to Earth and get a spear like his father's. But after invading Wakanda and getting access to the Great Mound, as well as seeing for himself the many ways the Wakandans use vibranium, and now this has his ambitions shooting through the roof. He wants to make a vibranium throne, put his brother's skull on the wall as a trophy. You know, he's ready to show out. And the members of his hunting party are practically on the same thing because there's a ton of them hunting throughout Wakanda to collect trophies because they want to show their strength as well. But as one of these predators is collecting a lion's skull, he holds it to his chest like, oh yeah, this is going to look nice right here, only to soon after catch a spear through the back from none other than Okoye, who at this point has now killed three of them. And right after this, she's nearly taken out by another predator who spotted her from up in the trees. But that one's taken out by T'Challa, who shows up and snaps its neck, which is something I don't think I've seen before in any Predator film or comic. Like, I can only imagine that takes a significant amount of strength. And so now, this is the first time T'Challa and Okoye have seen each other since the Predators arrived. So at first, they're just relieved to know that the other's okay. But now, they've got to figure out their next move. Because prior to this, when their comms were taken down, this let T'Challa and the others know that Burn and Zana had already been compromised. So right here, one of the members of the Hot Tutsurazi suggests that they hurry there. So T'Challa tells them that they will move quickly, but they've got to be careful in planning their next move because these intruders have already caught them off guard before and that's already cost them many lives. So if they were to rush now without thinking, that could cost them even more. So next, T'Challa goes over what they've learned about this new enemy so far. And one of the first and most obvious things is that they're hunters, which from there begs the question, why would they hunt in Wakanda? Since there's plenty of other places on earth they could have hunted. So after posing this question, the answer is pretty obvious and that's vibranium. And I mean, sure, there's other places on Earth where you could find vibranium, like the Antarctic vibranium with its antimetal properties. I'm sure there's some locations where you can still find reverberium, which is like your synthetic vibranium. But among the rest, there's nothing like pure Wakandan vibranium. And there's no place in the world that has more than the Great Mound. So T'Challa and the others hurry to get there next. And as they do, for a moment here, we jump back over to Shuri, who we last saw with Magikina, just outside of Wakanda's border being pulled back inside the perimeter by a scout predator. But as he tries to keep Shuri from getting pulled in, he's quickly wounded in the process. And you can tell that he knows that this is about it for him because he tells Shuri, all water is connected to other water, just as all blood is connected to other blood, which is pretty much him saying his goodbyes here. But even still, Shuri tells him to get back as if moving to a safe distance was an option for this guy, only for this predator to be like, nope, I'm not even gonna let him get the chance. And after Magikina is killed, Shuri just tumbles forward, holding the Predator's arm to pull him outside of the perimeter shield so she can have a better chance of fighting it head on. And the only thing she has to fight with is a spear that she pulls out of Magikina's eye. So as this Predator pulls out its shurikens, he taunts Shuri by playing an audio that's part of the Magi's last few words, with it saying all blood is connected to other blood just before the two of them go at it. And when they do, since Shuri can't communicate with anyone in Wakanda, she instead uses her comms to send a distress call to the outside world, hoping that someone will hear it and send reinforcements. But she keeps it short, because in the here and now, she's got to survive this fight in front of her. But following this, as T'Challa and the others are making their way to the Great Mound, for a moment here, we do a bit of a flashback. Because as they make their way, T'Challa's quiet. Because he believes their strength in silence, just like their strength in a mask. And we're told here, he needed to be silent now because he was afraid. Because of what he had learned, when the Yalcha struck him with their shoulder cannons, when he fell into the swamp and the mud swallowed him, when darkness came, and he visited the ancestral plane. 
Cause like we saw back in issue 1 when T'Challa was knocked out of the trees by the different scout predators who hit him with their plasma cannons, he was out of it for some time. So now what this does is it goes back to that moment before he came to and it tells us that T'Challa took a trip to the ancestral plane and he had a talk with his grandfather, Azuri the Wise. Where during this talk, Azuri tells T'Challa that the Predators came to Wakanda before. Which is something that we knew from issue 1 since the Predator who's there now, he was defeated by his brother who used their father's spear, which was made of vibranium that came from Wakanda. But what's new and interesting is that we didn't know this Yaucha's father fought against Azuri. And he goes on to tell T'Challa here, close to 500 of us died before it was all over. We burned their bodies, but we studied their weapons. Their cloaking technology helped inspire the perimeter shield, as did their greed for blood and vibranium. I was called an isolationist, but you can perhaps understand why. I wanted to protect my people, not just from these predators, but from all predators. And I'm saddened to say, that task now falls to you, grandson. And I gotta admit, that's a pretty wild revelation that just sends my imagination down a rabbit hole. And I really like that concept because it creates a reasoning to Wakanda's leap in technological advances based on Yaucha tech and driven by Zuri's paranoia. And to bring it back to these predators who've come now, this also explains how they were able to get through Wakanda's barriers so easily and hack all of their tech because it was based on their own. But Azuri goes on to say, if I'm certain of anything, it is this, there will be nothing but bones and ashes left of Wakanda. If these predators have their way, you must stop them. The Panther must win, which now brings us back to the present with T'Challa, who's made his way to the Great Mound with the others. And as soon as they arrive, T'Challa gets the drop on two of these predators who were here watching the entrance. And after he does, the Dora Milaje gets to stabbing him like crazy. But when they all leave from here to go deeper into the mines, we find out that T'Challa made a huge mistake because one of these predators was still alive and they managed to send the word out to their clan leader to let him know that the Black Panther is coming. So right now with T'Challa and the others still believing that they have the element of surprise, that is no longer the case. And it's all because of one little slip up. And we're told here that T'Challa made this mistake because of his haste, because of his fear. And with that said, I want you guys to keep in mind, from what we've seen in this story so far, we're dealing with the younger T'Challa who's still trying to figure out how to run his kingdom and how to protect it. Because going into this, we saw the whole thing with him and Shuri going back and forth about the idea of Wakanda opening up and helping others, which will make it interesting to see what he thinks about Shuri calling outsiders for help. But going into this, we're just shown that T'Challa's been doing things the way that his fathers did before him, which on one hand has him very closed off and protective as far as Wakanda's concerned. But that way of thinking is only pacified his inexperience. But now that he's facing this new threat that's crazier than anything he's seen before, sure, there's some slip-ups along the way. But in the larger picture, it seems like now, this T'Challa, he's being challenged to think and move differently. And it's happening at a time where there's little to no room for error. So yeah, usually I would feel some type of way about a T'Challa making a rookie mistake like that. But after taking all the factors into consideration, it's like, okay, I get it. Because it's not so much what's happening as it is when it's happening. But at the end of the day, when you're facing a threat like this, it doesn't care why you slipped up. And it's going to use everything it can to its advantage to end him. So yeah, it's not looking good for T'Challa because the Predator and his clan, they know he's coming. And following this, for a moment, we head back over to Shuri, who's barely come out on top against the scout that was trying to grab her to where after she kills it, she pulls off its helmet. And when she does, you know she's got to tell him how ugly he is. Wouldn't be a Predator story if she didn't. But with her investigating this predator just out of curiosity, she soon realizes that its helmet is more than armor. It's a computer. So now this allows the history of this Wakanda's technology, which is based on Yaucha technology, to once again work in the Wakandans' favor. Because since the Wakandan technology of this world was based on Yaucha tech, this opens up the possibilities for Shuri to use this helmet to her advantage. But not long after she puts it on, she hears something fly overhead, which at first has her like, okay, what now? So she looks up and it's Falcon, who is responding to her distress signal. And it's funny because she's looking at him like, who are you supposed to be? And he's never met her either, so there's that. But as it turns out, Falcon was already in Africa, shutting down a weapons dealer when he heard the call, so he came to check it out. So yeah, I'm not exactly sure if this is going to turn the tides in Wakanda's favor, but really at this point, they need any help they can get. And that has me thinking, because I want to ask you guys, and let me know in the comments, 
But if you send out an SOS and somebody replies, is it disrespectful to send out another SOS while they stand in there in hopes of better help showing up? Let me know what you guys think in the comments. And so now real quick, I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dope spill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and we'll do it again on the next one. All right, later.